Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Linda Barlamosha. I'm a pediatrician who works with McCarrie University, Johns Hopkins University Research Collaboration. I've been working on the birth defect surveillance project in Uganda since 2014, and we welcome you to joining us for our first webinar for the Sub-Saharan Congenital Anomalies Network in conjunction with the Global Health Network. I'm delighted to be joined today by our panel of speakers. The first speaker today is going to be Helen Malerbe, and she's going to be presenting from South Africa. She's the director of the Rare Diseases Association in South Africa. Our second presenter today will be Ushma Mehta, who is the PI for the, the Ubomi Boli Bule project in South Africa. The third presenter today will be Leke Amen King, who is one of the co-founders for the Health Research Foundation. And last, we'll have um, Daniel Mwanja Mumpe, who is the program manager for the hospital-based birth defect surveillance program in Uganda. But before we begin, we have a few housekeeping um, issues to take care of. So this workshop is being recorded, as you're aware, and will be shared by the Global Health Network platform. We will also ask you to please use the chat box to introduce yourself, or if you have any technical questions. Please use the QA box if you need to post any questions on the topics, and we'll be addressing these questions at the end of all of the presentations. So due to the large number of participants on the Zoom call, uh, we will be asking you, or uh, your cameras and microphones will actually be automatically disabled. But if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and we will give you permission and enable your microphone. So last but not least, again, please use the chat if you have any technical issues as we're presenting. So today's topic, it will be birth defect surveillance, why and how the African experience. And this webinar is funded by UKRI, MRC, and as well as supported by the Global Health Network. And it's one of our first webinars under the Sub-Saharan African Congenital Anomalies Network. So this will be one of eight that will be coming up soon. So as a beginning, I'll just give you some background. And this is primarily for those who are not familiar with birth defects. Birth defects or congenital anomalies are structural or functional anomalies that occur during intrauterine life and can be identified either prenatally, at birth, and sometimes only detected later in infancy. Birth defects are important causes of infant and childhood death, as well as chronic illness and disabilities. The most common ones we see are heart defects, neural tube defects, as well as Down syndrome. Globally, there are about 5.5 million new cases each year, and they're the fifth leading cause of death among children under five. 50% of under, under five deaths are actually in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and 94% of all severe cases of congenital anomalies are in low and middle income countries. So why surveillance and why in Africa? Well, this is because the largest burden of, this, of congenital anomalies is in Africa. 33% of global deaths in children under five are due to congenital anomalies in sub-Saharan Africa. And these congenital anomalies cause serious disabilities and impact the lives of children, as well as their families, the health systems and society at large. So the burden of congenital anomalies can be reduced though through vaccination, dietary supplementation, and prenatal and periconceptual care. However, it's important to note that there is geographic variability. So we need to know the true burden in a population because it's important for planning for public health action. So congenital anomaly surveillance will help us to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals and aim, which sustainable development goal number three in particular, which aims to reduce the under five mortality to less than 25 per thousand live births. 
So what types of surveillance programs are there? And what is the purpose? The primary purpose is to monitor and investigate changes in occurrence of congenital anomalies in order to prevent them as well as to reduce their morbidity. And there are two main types of surveillance models, population-based, hospital-based, which also includes sentinel surveillance. And you can have coverage either on a sub-national level in a specific area within the country, national coverage, as well as regional across countries. This slide here basically shows you um, the existing conjunctal anomaly surveillance programs around the world. It was done by a survey um, by um, Vijaya Carnchella, and this was done in conjunction with WHO. It may not be absolutely up to date, but at the time, around 2018, these were the existing congenital anomaly surveillance programs. And you can see that in Africa, there are very few. Now, these programs are actually, some of them have joined networks, and these networks exist in Europe as well as the US. So in the US, we have the National Birth Defect Prevention Program, and we have a clamp in South America. There's also ICBDSR, which is an international surveillance network, EuroCAT in Europe, as well as SEAR in Asia. And there's a recent one that was established in 2016, the RELAMP network in Latin America. And we're hoping to create, establish a network here in Africa. So the Sub-Saharan African Congenital Anomalies Network is a seed project in order to establish an African Congenital Anomalies Network. And it's funded through UKRI MR MRC. And our primary aim is to improve the diagnosis of congenital anomalies, primarily structural, as well as the care of affected children and families, and also to promote identification of their causes. And this will be done through evidence-based, through surveillance and research, improving capacity as we're doing today, as well as increasing capacity for collaborative research and paving an impact pathway on policy and practice. So this network is led by a team of co-investigators working together with partners in 10 African countries, the UK and the US. And together we aim to establish network governance, membership criteria, train health professionals like in webinars today, develop a website, and conduct a scoping review of current literature and write a position paper on the burden of birth defects in Sub-Saharan Africa. So our aim today is in the series of webinars and part of this aim will be established today is to focus on surveillance at African sites. Today we'll hear from three. Um, later on, we'll also discuss prevalence and care of congenital anomalies in other webinars and we're hoping to build capacity in a means to share resources as well as multidisciplinary experience and expertise. We're hoping to share the current status of activities in new emerging and established birth defects surveillance projects in Africa. And we want you to reflect and see how, to, how we can conduct collaborative activities, activities such as research, common protocols, pooling and comparing data between countries. So again, today, this is the first of eight webinars, which will be happening on the last Wednesday of each month. And later on, we'll discuss other African surveillance systems, as well as topics related to prevention and care. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Helen Malerbe. And Helen is the director of Rare Diseases South Africa. She heads up the research and epi research and epidemiology portfolio for this nonprofit. She works, her organization works to ensure that people living with rare diseases and congenital anomalies experience better recognition, support, improved health services, as well as better life overall. Helen has just completed a postdoc um, placement at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So please join me in welcoming Helen to our webinar today. 
Hi, thanks, Linda. And good afternoon, everyone, from a very sunny Johannesburg um, in South Africa. Um, so as outlined by Linda, I'm just going to be giving um, the first part of a presentation that Ushma is going to follow with. I'm going to be focusing on the why. Why do birth defect surveillance in South Africa? Um, and I'm currently in between academic affiliations, um, having left University of Guzulu Natal, and I will be joining potentially a new um, academic institute in later in the year. So just to give you a, a snapshot in time of the health profile of South Africa. So South Africa has, um, we're, we're just coming up to about 60 million people based on the population of 2020. And that's divided amongst nine provinces in South Africa. And you can see by the map, um, as indicated by the percentage of the population, we've got some very large provinces like Northern Cape with a very low population density with only 2% of the population. And that has implications for our healthcare. And then you can look at Hauteng, which is that very small province, which is where Pretoria and Johannesburg are based, where we have only over a quarter of our total population in that small space. Hence the current challenge with the third wave of COVID. Um, our population is a very young one. Um, almost a third of our population is aged 15 years or younger. Um, and that's largely due to um, the high adult mortality as a result of HIV. We have about a million births per year. Um, a large over half of our population um, is urbanized in the sense that people have moved from the rural areas to the urban areas and 63% live in urban areas. As of 2012, it's likely to be higher now. We have one of the lowest fertility rates in Africa, which ranges between 1.9 to about 2.9, depending on which province you're in, averaging out at about 2.4. Um, our life expectancy um, or longevity is increasing again with men living to an average of just under 63 years and um, females to just under 69. That was as of last year. And then childhood mortality, um, whether it be under five mortality, which is 34 per thousand, which is the chance of an under five year old dying um, with a child dying within the first five years of life. Um, similarly, for infant mortality rate, that's 25 per thousand live births. And the neonatal mortality rate, or the chance of a baby dying within the first four weeks of life, is 11 per thousand. In terms of HIV and that pandemic, the current prevalence, as of um, figures published last year, the prevalence rate in 15 to 49 year olds is 13%. Um, if you have a look at um, the rate of pregnant women that are affected or the proportion, that's around 30%. And interestingly, our, our advanced maternal age or mothers um, that are having babies over the age of 35 has actually increased in recent years um, to about 16%. Um, and that was based on 2019 stats. And the South African public, well, the South African healthcare system is a dual system where we have about 85% um, of state services and 15% of the population accessing private healthcare. But we have a situation currently, although we're heading towards universal healthcare through our national, in, national health initiative, we are actually having the lion's share of our resources actually going to that smaller private sector at the moment. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of definitions, because many of you will know that there are all these terms that are thrown around, birth defects, congenital disorders, congenital anomalies, fetal malformations, and so on. It can get very confusing. And not all of those terms are equal. But essentially, in 2006, there was an international consultative meeting um, headed by WHO and involving the March of Dimes program as well. Um, and basically they all got together and they decided that birth defects is synonymous with congenital disorders. And essentially, as Linda has outlined in the intro, that they may be defined as abnormalities in structure or function that are present from birth, including metabolic disorders, which may manifest at birth or later in life. So if you look on the screen, um, you can break it down, in this case, according to etiology, um, birth defects or congenital disorders are made up of chromosomal disorders, congenital and single gene malformations, kind of the obvious stuff. And then you've got other groupings or etiologies, functional single gene disorders, multifactorial or genetic risk. And then you've got teratogens or that are essentially caused by abnormalities, sorry, abnormalities in the fetal environment. But what's interesting is that congenital anomalies per se are just a portion or a subset of birth defects. And that's what is largely represented in ICD-10 chapter 17, otherwise known as the Q chapter. And these are the obvious or structural 
um, component or parts of congenital disorders that are usually those that are surveilled because it's the obvious, it's the low hanging fruits. But in a low middle income country context, it's really important that we don't misrepresent and say congenital anomalies are birth defects or congenital disorders. They are only a sub portion. Um, and the danger there is if we say that's the total burden of disease, then we're not representing our total burden of disease. And a lot of people are going without the care and um, that they need. So within this category of congenital anomalies in South Africa, um, there have been a number of priority conditions that have been designated by our National Department of Health. Um, these were publications back in 2001 and 2004, and these human genetic guidelines are current in, currently in the process of being revised now and finalized. So I've got listed here a few of the priority conditions, albinism, which is oculocutaneous albinism, which has got a higher birth prevalence in South Africa, cleft lip and palate down syndrome, neural tube defect, which includes spina bifida and hydrocephalus, and then you've got club feet. Now, some of these are, may also be part of a syndrome, uh, whereas others may be isolated in the um, isolated congenital disorders or anomalies, or they may be part of a um, multiple, um, multiple congenital disorders. So what you've got listed here is the research studies that are, have indicated the specific birth prevalence, the rate at which these occur. And you can see these research studies, a lot of them happened a long time ago. Um, so they're quite old. Uh, but from that, we, because it's the only, um, you know, indicative numbers that we have, we can actually estimate the expected number that we would see. And then just a little snapshot there in that final column is how many were actually reported through national surveillance that is administered by the Department of Health, as they reported in an article in 2016. And you can see that the numbers don't match. And I will come back to that later, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what the key congenital anomalies are that are actually um, up for surveillance in South Africa. So what do we mean by surveillance? I thought it would be good just to have the go-to definition included here from CDC. Um, and I think before we go into this, we've got to remember that surveillance is a team sport and it's not a spectator sport. And it's not just a sports day, it's sports for life, so to speak. So it's the ongoing and systematic collection and analysis and interpretation of health data essential for public health practice, closely integrated with the timely dissemination of these data to those that need to know. And the final link in the chain is applying these data to prevention and control. So allowing this data to inform the public health response and the development of policies and implementation of those policies. And I think the other crucial thing about surveillance is we don't just count, we need to do something with the numbers that we're collecting and make sure that we give feedback to policymakers, but also to the people that are um, submitting the data so that they can get some kind of incentive to continue. So I'm gonna come back to the why, why do surveillance in South Africa? And this graph um, really changed my life so many years ago. So this essentially shows um, how that all these bars are countries and from left you have least developed to most developed on the right. And then you've got the line actually showing the proportion of deaths, in this case, infant deaths that are due to birth defects. So as these bars decrease and overall mortality decreases, there are less deaths occurring, but all of a sudden there seems to be a greater proportion of deaths due to birth defects. And I've just given an indication here of where South Africa is based on our current infant mortality rate of 25 per thousand you can see we're right there at the bottom of that huge climb. So it's gonna represent birth defects or congenital anomalies, whatever we're specifically talking about, is going to represent a much huger um, percentage proportion of our burden of disease, and we need to be prepared for that. Another way of looking at this is through the World Bank country classifications. So for example, South Africa is classified as an upper middle income country. Um, look, a lot of these have changed, particularly with um, COVID, but based on this graph that was done in 2016, what this shows is in South Africa, for example, as an upper middle income country, the range of that proportion of birth defects, in this case, um, as a proportion of under five deaths, somewhere between nine and 14% of our under five deaths are due to birth defects or congenital anomalies. When you get to the high income stage, 
and we're talking about countries like USA, UK, Australia, and so on, we're talking about almost a third of under five deaths being due to congenital anomalies. So we've got to think about where we're headed and the trend that we're following with our burden of disease as we evolve and we transition as a country and become more developed. So just focusing on a little bit more on the epidemiology in South Africa, this graph shows the epidemiological transition in South Africa from about 1974 to 2019. The gray line and the brown line actually are under five mortality and infant mortality. And it showed how that came down from the 1960s and how we really started, you know, sorting out um, infectious diseases and, and so on. And we were getting really getting a handle on things. And the blue dotted line, which is life expectancy, started to improve. So less children were dying, people were living for longer. But then something happened. Um, and that is the green line, HIV, which put us back into a negative transition with more children dying under five, more children dying under the age of one, until that point in about 2004, 2005, when we really started to implement antiretrovirals um, as a complete rollout throughout the country and other health interventions, that we had a really steep decrease in the number of deaths. But what you can see from this to the right hand side of the graph is that from 2011, it's all stagnated. We haven't seen further significant reductions in our infant mortality or under five mortality. And we're not going to until we collectively and comprehensively address birth defects, congenital disorders as a health issue in South Africa through the implementation of comprehensive genetic services. This has been noted in the literature in many places that the future improvements have to look at other issues, um, at non-communicable diseases of which birth defects are the first one experienced in life. And it's only going to be when we reach that IM infant mortality rate target of about 10 per thousand live births that everyone's going to have access to optimal genetic services. So what is the framework, the legal framework in South Africa and why notify? So while there are a number of um, conditions um, which are notifiable by law in South Africa, currently birth defects are not. The only birth defect that is currently notifiable by law is um, congenital syphilis, which is an example of a congenital infection. With regards to birth defects, we are covered by the National Health Act, which basically specifies that or provides for genetic services in South Africa. And then we've got two references to surveillance, epidemiological surveillance nationally and provincially, um, which falls under the remit of the National Health Act. And so just to give an example of what genetic services are, they have to be the best possible care in the prevailing circumstances. We don't expect them to be perfect and we know it's gonna be a progressive approach, but we need to make sure that those services that are provided for by law that are actually implemented in South Africa. But then what's really exciting in South Africa is this new NAPISA Act, which is the National Public Health Institute of South Africa. So this was, it came into law, it was published by the Government Gazette in August 2020. And what this actually does, it, it provides a new umbrella for all surveillance in South Africa. So that surveillance of cancer, of HIV, all the communicable diseases, as well as NCDs, um, also public health and so on. But this is where we can actually work to have um, to build up regulations to make sure that surveillance does occur for birth defects in South Africa. Obviously, with the current global pandemic, um, it hasn't moved much further than that. Um, but this is where it provides a space for us to leverage for um, and ensure that surveillance is actually implemented. And the one thing with congenital disorders we have to remember, um, and this is why we need to do surveillance, is that 70% of congenital disorders can be prevented, cured, or the disability mitigated. So essentially, the quality of life can be improved for patients. So while in 30% of cases you can't do anything, in 40% you can actually um, have there's some kind of intervention, for example, surgery for congenital heart defects and so on. And then in the other 30% of cases, you can reduce that um, lifelong disability and improve the quality of life. So it's really essential that we come against this myth that nothing can be done because it has long been documented that it can be. So what's really um, happened is 
birth defects have remained this invisible, a uh, buried burden of disease. Um, so it's very much the iceberg. You can see the tip of the iceberg here, which is potentially we're talking about things like Down syndrome, cleft lip and palate, and those obvious congenital anomalies. But underneath it, there is so much more that is just being revealed as these, imagine the water is the deaths, um, the childhood deaths from other conditions coming down and down, and it's going to reveal more and more. But we have inadequate expertise. We just don't have enough people that are trained and qualified to diagnose um, and refer and care. We have the ongoing burden of infectious diseases that are continuing in parallel to emerging non-communicable diseases. We have misdiagnosis occurring. Often the infectious disease is the obvious one. It will be diagnosed first. And we have ongoing malnutrition and poverty. And as the population in Africa as our continent in increases, even if poverty comes down, the number of those people, um, the number of people um, in poverty and um, those situations resulting in malnutrition is still going to rise. So key numbers for South Africa. We know that about 6.87% of live births are affected by a CD, a congenital disorder. And that's congenital disorders as a whole. So that means of 1 million births, that's somewhere between 50 and 70,000 births that are affected every year, bearing in mind that only a small proportion will be diagnosed at birth. And that's affecting one in 15 births. 80% of those are genetic in cause, but at the moment, 90% are not being reported via national surveillance. They might be being recorded in clinical registries and so on, but they are not being notified nationally. And this is underpinned by that capacity issue. This is the figure that was published in 2016. It, it kind of goes up and down as more medical geneticists qualify and then others emigrate and some retire. So it's a dynamic moving number. But at my last count, it was 12 medical geneticists for 60 million South Africans, and they're only available in three provinces. And so if you happen to be born in a province where there's no medical geneticist or genetics clinic, it's a very dire situation. And just to finish off, I just want to talk about how does this all affect the lack of capacity, um, the poor surveillance coverage, so basically, we have a, at the top right, a lack of prioritization. Birth defects, congenital anomalies are not prioritized as a healthcare issue. As a result, the, neglected, so the services are neglected, and that's been shown in the literature that in South Africa, as compared to a number of other LMIC countries, we have seen that neglect. This results in further non-diagnosis or misdiagnosis of CDs, and then we have inadequate data. We, if we can't diagnose something, we can't count it. So we first have to build up that capacity and expertise to diagnose, and then in parallel, um, improve the surveillance. We're having to rely on modeling to some degree, but ultimately at the moment, underreporting is resulting in an underestimate of burden of disease. And because we are an evidence-based um, health system, and, and we follow very much in the wake of the UK, we need an evidence base to inform um, the development of our health services. So without that surveillance and empiric data, things aren't going to change. And just finally, to give you a snapshot of the current birth notification system, birth defect notification system in South Africa, um, a report was published in 2016 for this new system that's been implemented since 2006. It is administered by the National Department of Health. It is known as the birth defect notification tool. It is a paper-based system. It is a passive system and it's a single source surveillance system. Notifications occur within 24 hours of birth, bearing in mind that normal births are usually um, leave the hospital within six hours in the state system. It is not NICD-10 compatible, which has, I think, been one of the major disadvantages of the system. And over an eight-year period, only 13,252 cases were notified, bearing in mind we should be seeing about 50,000 per year minimum. So we are underreporting by 98%. We're excluding many other data sets that are in the hospital, at laboratories um, and in clinics. So the system is being revised currently, but this has really opened the door to a new way of how to do this. And this is where the project Ubome Bukle comes in that Usha is going, Ushma is now going to talk to you about. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Ushma now. Thank you, Helen, for your presentation. So as we wait for Ushma to share her screen, Dr. Ushma Mehta is the co-PI of the Ubomi Bule project in South Africa. 
She's involved in pharmacovigilance and medicine regulations since 1996, and she started her career as the manager of the South African Pharmacovigilance Center and has assisted WHO in developing regulatory and programmatic pharmacovigilance systems for malaria vaccines, HIV TB, and maternal and child health programs. She's currently the senior researcher at the Center for Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Research at the University of Cape Town's School of Public Health and Family Medicine. And she's also a board member of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. So welcome, Ushma. Please um, go ahead and share your presentation with us. Thank you, Linda, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak at this con at this webinar. Uh, I did ask Adam or Nicola to perhaps put the slides my slides up, but I'm happy to share if it's better that uh, I share them directly. Um, let me try and share my screen. Um, I think. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to just give an overview of Ubomi Bushle, the project that uh, Helen spoke about. So Ubomi Bushle, just uh, to give you an over, um, is, is a also word meaning life is, well, it's two words, meaning life is beautiful. Um, and it stands for understanding birth outcomes from mothers and infants building healthcare by linking exposures. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it really hopefully um, communicates the, 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 the remit of the project, but also the, the hope that we can support uh, life through this project and uh, healthy pregnancies. The project is supported by several partners, including the national and provincial departments of health in which the project will be um, based. So we have many uh, partners that, and the project is currently funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the USCDC. So what gave birth to this project? Um, as many of you probably know, the safety of antiretroviral medicines in pregnancy has received a lot of attention from stabudine to nevirapine to efavirenz and most recently dolutegravir. And it really has highlighted the importance, especially in a country like South Africa, which has a very high burden of HIV, the importance of monitoring the safety of these antiretrovirals in pregnant women. So the South African National AIDS Council and the National Department of Health recognize the importance on an ongoing basis to have some kind of safety surveillance system for antiretrovirals. And also with the recent um, approval of pre-exposure prophylaxis in pregnant women, there was also recognition that not just HIV infected, but HIV infected women also need to be monitored for the safety of interventions. And we know globally that there's a big push to support safe and healthy pregnancies uh, and a pipeline of drugs uh, targeting pregnant women um, is being developed, not just drugs, but vaccines as well. So there was also an appreciation that public health medicines as a whole that are targeting women of childbearing age need to also uh, 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 you know, look at, we need to also look at some kind of safety surveillance for, for the pregnant population, specifically looking at birth outcomes. So Ubomi Bushle has two main objectives. One is to build capacity, recognizing that this is a health system strengthening project, builds capacity at Sentinel surveillance sites in three provinces, uh, the Western Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, and Gauteng province to obtain reliable routine antenatal, obstetric, and medical um, and med medicinal information, as well as perinatal uh, data in the cohort of pregnant women. The other objective is to establish a national pregnancy exposure registry through the enrollment and follow-up of a cohort of pregnant women uh, in the case 
of Ubomi Bushli at the moment around 15 to 20,000 pregnancies per year from these sentinel sites to assess the impact of therapeutic interventions such as antiretrovirals on maternal and neonatal outcomes. So the pregnancy exposure registry is really cutting across all medicines, not just or at least medicines used on a large scale in pregnant women, uh, not just antiretrovirals, but of course, the initial focus will be on these drugs. The commitment by the project partners was to develop a sustainable, adequately capacitated and clinically useful surveillance system for maternal and newborn health that can be handed over to the National Department of Health within three to five years. So this is just a pictogram of what the pregnancy exposure registry looks like. It is a purely intervention, uh, um, observational uh, cohort of pregnant women who are enrolled at the first, their first antenatal visit at 15 sentinel surveillance sites across the three provinces. These sentinel surveillance sites include uh, primarily urban, but uh, some peri-urban uh, sites. Enrollment is um, basically just by virtue of women attending that antenatal facility. Some of the provinces have chosen uh, an opt-out system whereby women are provided with patient information leaflets, as well as posters are placed on the facility walls to say that this is a pregnancy registry site and that for surveillance purposes, uh, your data will be collected and, and are used for surveillance in an anonymized way. Uh, in some, in one of the provinces, the ethics committee uh, required that enrollment occurred with, con with full informed consent. And the reason for this was that the data was not being collected as part of the provincial uh, health services platform, but, uh, but being overseen by research institutions primarily. But how, nevertheless, the differences in the models still allowed for, has allowed for a pooling of the data across all the provinces into a national pregnancy registry database. The database uh, will, uh, at the end of the, um, the, uh, the pregnancy, women's maternity case records, which is a patient health record, is kept at the delivery facility and archived in the medical records. So it's at the end of the pregnancy, the information is captured in, on women who are enrolled in the pregnancy registry. That information is captured into a, uh, a database. The information that's collected includes maternal and obstetric history, maternal health, any illnesses or underlying conditions, and any medicines being used during the pregnancy. Um, in addition, we'll be collecting information, of course, on gestational dating, ultrasound find, uh, gestational ultrasound data, as well as information on the birth outcome, including the results of the surface examination at birth. So this is a, a page, two pages out of the maternity case record. And as you can see, this page collects, the first page collects information on the surface examination. This is captured um, in, or at least the, the relevant findings are captured into the database. And uh, this also will include APCA scores, the birth weight, uh, gestational uh, age at birth, head circumference, uh, gender, ex sex, et cetera. The data then is captured into three different um, types of databases at the provincial level, depending on which province uh, is uh, collecting the data. And that data uh, is collected. We've managed to standardize the data using a data exchange standard that was based on WHO's uh, data exchange or data dictionary that was developed for their pregnancy registry project. That data is then pooled it, once anonymized, completely anonymized into a national database. I think this is really important uh, point because we have just tomorrow, in fact, will be the officials launch of the Poppy Act, which is the protection of patient information, of sorry, personal information act. And essentially without consent, people's data cannot be collected 
other than obviously for their personal care. So if the data is to be used uh, outside of clinical care, so for instance, in the case of surveillance, the data either needs to be anonymized or we need to obtain full consent. Now, consent was not seen as a feasible and sustainable approach uh, by some of the provinces. And we are moving towards getting all the provinces to have a system whereby the data is collected on a provincial health platform so that it can also be used for clinical care, thereby maximizing the benefit or the beneficence of that data. But really, uh, that data will be anonymized by removing any potential identifiers, as well as perturbing the dates that may allow one to go back and trace the patient. But in terms of birth defect surveillance, this has also got an additional element to it, which I will explain shortly. In terms of our capacity building goals, we've, um, we've decided that in order to improve the quality of data that we receive and make sure that we get good quality ascertainment of exposures as well as good data on uh, drug history, uh, on birth outcomes, we, are, we have integrated training materials into the national sexual and reproductive health training for midwives and nurses across the country that includes history taking on medicines, safe prescribing, uh, neonatal surface examinations using the WHO surface exam video, congenital anomalies, common congenital anomalies and how to recognize them, and some basic genetics. We've employed a genetics, well, we've training a genetics counselor for one of the provinces. Nursing uh, staff at some of the facilities will be trained on gestational, how to conduct gestational dating scans. And we are training all the ANC and labor ward staff on uh, medicines use, record keeping, congenital anomalies, how to conduct a surface examination uh, using our training materials that we've developed. In addition, in terms of strengthening the health system, uh, the project will uh, obviously conduct data analyses on a regular basis, providing feedback to the Sentinel sites on the data that we receive from those sites feedback to clinic staff on uh, the women and babies that they see who may be referred on. The National Department of Health is quite keen on developing an online or a birth defect notification system. So we're using um, the, or we're reprogramming, perhaps just modifying the Global Birth Defect app, which is available on this, uh, on the Global Health Network's website to have, um, to, to collect a little more information that links the mother to the baby, as well as providing some information that allows the app to also be used as a notification tool in South Africa. So the pregnancy registry will conduct some uh, monitoring on the feasibility and the validation of this app within the project and as a notification tool. What's important here is that this allows for birth defects to be, in addition to what's captured in the maternity case record, to also take photographs, consented photographs, and allow them to be linked to the pregnancy registry records. These photographs will not be housed in the national database, but will only stay on the provincial service for the purposes of protection of patient information and identity. So this is just how, what, how the birth defect app will work. The, the nurse at the, at the labor ward would see perhaps a, a child with a congenital malformation or disorder. That will be, um, the, the, the mom will provide consent to the photograph being taken. If she agrees to, to allow the photograph to be taken, it will be uh, taken through the app and reported to a national cloud server for receiving, dedicated to receiving the birth defects. These, um, these reports will be sent to the relevant pregnancy registry database, provincial database, uh, without touching the national database. So it's really a dedicated standalone server that only 
transmits the, the, the photographs and the information derived from the app to the relevant database where the record, the, the, the electronic report will be linked to the pregnant um, pregnancy uh, under surveillance, the, the specific pregnancy through the patient identifiers. And then the record is linked, as I said, and then uh, the clinical geneticist who is linked to that particular province will be able will be notified by the uh, provincial custodians of the database to assist in coding, uh, um, providing some certainty of the level to which they are the level of certainty of their code and whether or not the report needs to be further reviewed by a birth defect panel. Um, and also proposed management and some feedback on the quality of the photograph so that we can improve the photograph qualities. So uh, just to, to conclude um, a few points that we've had, so we have some challenges in terms of, uh, and we've I prioritized capacity building around those challenges, such as the getting consistently good quality surface examination data. We're doing quite a bit of training around that, improving gestational dating, which is not done consistently across the sites by improving ultrasound services at those sites, uh, in inadequate clinical geneticists, particularly in one of the provinces, which we are trying to build capacity around, and um, the modification of the Global Birth Defect app to hopefully serve as a tool to support birth defect notification in the country. And lastly, to uh, link maternal records across facilities between the mother and the infant by helping with um, record linkage based activities that are happening in the country. Um, this is just to simply, I, I've raised all these points already uh, about how the data will be managed, but I'd like to conclude by thanking the, the team uh, of uh, site PIs who have been really quite extraordinary in helping us to design and develop a system that is tailor-made for the South African context. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ushma. And we're looking forward to the data that will be coming out of the Ubomi Bushle project. Um, so our next presenter, um, and at, before we have our next presenter, please uh, bear with us with time. We will be trying to keep it, but uh, our next presenter right now is Leke Amen King. He is a fellow and he is one of the founders for the Health Research Foundation. Currently, he's associated with the University of Ulster or Ulster University where he completed his PhD. And he recently completed the work on the Global Birth Defect app that Ushma has presented, which was supported by the Zika Horizon Plan 2020 initiative. So welcome Leke, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Linda. And thanks to Helen and Ushma for that brilliant presentation, which sets the pace um, very well for me to um, share with you our first steps in creating a congenital anomaly registry in Cameroon, which we um, termed our the Caracas. So I thought. Um, to tell our story, we would just give you a brief overview of Cameroon and our situation with respect to congenital anomalies. And then um, tell you a little bit about how it all started and then give you an overview of what we've done so far, progress to date and our next steps. So Cameroon is a bilingual country made up of 30% English speaking and 70% French speaking uh, population of about 26 million as per 2019 statistics. And the under five mortality rate is still right up there, 18th in the world. And congenital anomalies um, are responsible for about five, uh, 9% of all neonatal deaths ranking the fit cause of death in the country. 
under for units under the age of uh, five. So currently, there is no ongoing surveillance program with respect to congenital anomalies in Cameroon, apart from the regular data that is collected by the Ministry of Health uh, from the hospitals. And just to give you an idea of, in terms of our capacity to uh, care for babies with congenital anomalies, I picked up um, cardiac anomalies, which consist about a third of all anomalies. And to tell you that we have just about three pediatric cardiac centers in the whole of the country. And the most uh, renowned one, which was established in 2001, and is uh, owned by the Catholic Mission, is about 450,000 kilometers away from the uh, capital um, city, Yaoundé. So babies who are born in most of the regions in the country, there are 10 regions, um, have to travel all the way to this one cardiac center, in, in a, which is located in a very remote area in the northwest region of the country. So when I did my PhD back in uh, 2016 at Ulster University and worked with the Eurocat database, it guided my thoughts around creating a congenital anomaly surveillance registry in Cameroon. And this was facilitated by the, my colleagues who helped me in the process of collecting data for my PhD on um, medication use in pregnancy. And so their motivation um, sustained the idea of creating this strategy. And when I completed my PhD in 2016 and went back home, we started working together on that idea and developed the first um, concept uh, um, uh, uh, note which will we use to engage a number of stakeholders from hospitals and administrators in the public health domain, nurses and midwives, and just kind of gathered the momentum and the temperature from that level to tease out the feasibility of people accepting the idea and um, working with us to develop this registry. So that's how we, we started. And then so far, we, our, the whole idea of the registry was centered on the core foundation of a congenital anomaly surveillance program, which is to provide data that will support prevention and care to uh, not only uh, monitoring data on prevalence, but also evaluating risk factors for congenital anomalies. And it would be a hospital-based surveillance program, and it would, be, uh, would have nested case control studies that will look at uh, risk, evaluate risk factors. And we have a particular interest in herbal medicine. The initial focus would be in the Southwest region, which is the English speaking region and one of the English speaking regions, actually there are two. And we would focus on six hospitals. And over time we would expand if uh, the resources permit to uh, other regions and hospitals in the, in the country. The central surveillance system would be hosted at Health Research Foundation um, and would have uh, strong collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health. So the registry will operate as an independent ent uh, uh, entity from the general uh, public health system, but then with very strong collaboration with the Ministry of Public Health. Initially, we intend to focus on major externally visible congenital anomalies for obvious reasons. Um, we have very limited expertise. And so we want to um, start with the ones that are very easy to uh, identify um, externally. And we would again focus only on life and still beds at 23, 22 weeks. Again, just to kind of limit the uh, uh, amount of work that uh, uh, expertise that we will need 
in, if we were to go down the road of um, prenatal diagnosis or looking at terminations, which most often uh, would be a difficult path to take at this early beginning. So the diagnosis of CAs will be done um, by the hospital staff who will be trained using the um, new Global Birth Defects app. And then uh, confirmation of this diagnosis will be done by a remote expert. So Ushma mentioned the use of this Global Bed Effect app, which is happens to be um, the app, the project that I've been working on for the past two years at All Star University. So all data collected, uh, all data will be collected at birth. Um, that means uh, at the hospital when the babies are born um, by, by a dedicated hospital staff. Now we've, de we've developed a questionnaire that will need to capture um, data from the, um, from the mothers um, through the REDCap mobile app. And we have created a database, um, REDCap, which is we're going to use um, to host the data set that we're going to be collecting. So that is the whole concept um, as an overview of what we are hoping to achieve uh, at this early beginning. And so far, we have, as I said, we have the team formed to work on this project. And I, I forgot to mention that this team is working um, mainly on voluntary basis. So we have engaged participating hospitals and stakeholders already. And that is why we were able to even forge ahead with the idea because without their uh, approval and engagement, uh, it would be an effort in futility. So, um, we have a draft protocol and questionnaire ready. And as I said, we've established the REDCap database and it's already customized for our use. So our next steps then is to review and validate the protocol that we've developed. So we'll have some expert, external experts to review our protocol and, and that will enable us to um, apply for ethical clearance, and then we can begin training of the, uh, at different levels. The team itself needs to be trained. We need to train the midwives and nurses or the hospital team in general. And then we can um, do a pilot process. And the most important, the big elephant in the house is funding. So once at uh, part of the next, uh, things that we have to be thinking about is where to get funding for this project. And if we are so lucky with our plan, we would be able to roll out in the next uh, couple of months to come. So that is that for our story. And we are just pretty much at the very early stages and this network is very timely um, for us in order in, in, in terms of the support that we can get. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Lucky. And we are here to support you as you begin your journey in Cameroon. So again, please excuse our going over time, but we have our one last presenter. And this presenter is from Uganda. His name is Daniel Mwanja Mumpe. He is a public health physician and the program manager for the hospital-based birth defect surveillance project in Uganda, which began in um, 2014. He's been part of the project from the time of implementation and has helped in developing the protocol, standard operating procedures and staff training. So welcome Daniel, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, um, Linda. And uh, I'm going to present um, the an overview of uh, the hospital best birth defect surveillance in uh, Kampala, Uganda. Okay, so um, 
My presentation is an overview of the protocol, and then I'll also talk about the achievements and uh, the challenges and solutions. So um, on the background of uh, limited uh, data on the prevalence of birth defects in Uganda, and also generally Africa, and uh, um, also with the fact that uh, Uganda had in 2012 initiated uh, the use of ART in the first trimester for control of, uh, for prevention of um, mother to child transmission of HIV. And then later in 2018, the introduction of a new drug um, in the regimen for PMTC, PMTCT, that is uh, Dolutegravir, which drugs we did not have much knowledge about um, the effects or safety of use in uh, our pregnancy. So in 2013, Makere University, Johns Hopkins University Research Collaboration partnered with uh, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to initiate a hospital-based birth surveillance system at four hospitals within um, Kampala, Uganda. The objectives of this project are to determine the baseline prevalence of major external birth defects and to also conduct a nested case control study to examine uh, the maternal use of uh, antiretroviral therapy and um, commonly used drugs in pregnancy with uh, birth defects. So we selected hospitals um, in such a way as to have a good representation of uh, the population. So the four hospitals are located within uh, three of uh, the five divisions of Kampala. And uh, the hospitals have an annual birth, um, which is estimated at 50% uh, of uh, the total births within uh, uh, Kampala. And they also represent about 80%, um, uh, more than 80% of the births within the health facilities. Um, so in this surveillance, we collect, uh, we examine all the newborns that are delivered at these four facilities. The examination is done by trained midwives uh, to determine whether there is any birth defect. And so um, they collect this data primarily uh, for the surveillance project, which means it is uh, uh, active case ascertainment of the birth defects. In addition to this, uh, the midwives do collect um, demographic and risk uh, factor data. They use um, Android uh, tablets using an open data kit uh, data collection tool and submit this data in real time. And uh, we do protect the data. There is uh, limited access uh, to this data by other individuals. So it's collected and submitted direct to um, the project server. Uh, confirmation of the diagnosis is uh, done to where we have a bedside confirmation uh, where a physician at each of the hospitals uh, examines the birth defect um, identified by the, the midwives to confirm uh, the diagnosis. But then in addition to that, the midwives do obtain consent, take a photograph and also write a narrative description of, of the birth defect, which is shared with uh, off-site experts to confirm uh, the diagnosis of the birth defect. So uh, the births that we do include, the inclusion criteria, the births we include in uh, um, this surveillance, we include all live and still births, uh, irrespective of the gestational age, as long as they are born at the four hospitals. So we only exclude the births which are not informative. That is those which are not well formed enough uh, for the midwives to determine whether there is presence or absence of a birth defect. And if a birth defect is diagnosed after the baby has been uh, discharged, we also do exclude um, that birth defect. So uh, to start with, um, we selected uh, major external easily identifiable birth defects and we selected 18 of them as uh, listed um, on there. Uh, however, uh, for guidance on um, uh, 
uh, further inclusion of birth defects with time, we do also collect information about other birth defects that um, we come across, though with not so much detail as we do for the 18. Now to implement this project, we um, went out into the hospitals in a phased manner, starting with one hospital and then adding others subsequently. And the advantage of this was that uh, it helped the midwives to cope with the additional uh, workload which came with uh, implementation of the surveillance activities and also for the training team to have enough time to train and help uh, reduce on the error rate. So in this graph, um, the births uh, represent the total births uh, per month from the time of um, when we started implementing this project, while um, the line graph uh, shows um, one of uh, a selected quality indicator, which is the number of births at a unit that have not been included in the surveillance. So you can see that as we went along um, implementing this project in the beginning, the number of births increased and then we had a high error rate. So you notice that as we added more hospitals, the error rate also subsequently increased, but then we were able to have this drop because um, the, the trainers had enough time to uh, concentrate on that at each site. Now, we also noticed later that as still we continued, um, despite the fact that we're not adding more hospitals, but as the number of births increased, due to one reason or another, still we had an increment in the, error, in the error rate, but with time we managed to suppress that. And on average, our error rate is now about 0.4% um, as per that uh, quality indicator. So um, to give you an, uh, uh, some of the findings from this project, um, let's look at uh, uh, the characteristics of the population that we are dealing with. Uh, here I present both maternal and uh, the newborn uh, characteristics, and I'll highlight um, uh, the big proportion of the mothers delivering at our hospitals are young mothers, and these are about 63%. Uh, we have an HIV prevalence of about 10% um, in this population. And of those 95% uh, on antiretroviral therapy. So we have also done uh, some analysis and uh, uh, written uh, papers. And here I present uh, some of the findings um, from uh, the birth defects of interest to our project. Uh, the prevalence as at the close of December 2017 was about uh, 66 per 10,000 uh, live births. Then uh, the most prevalent birth defects were hypospadias. For hypospadias, uh, note that we are using a denominator of only uh, male births. Then uh, the other uh, um, birth defects with a high prevalence include uh, talips, equinovirus, and uh, the neurotube defects. Uh, so other key achievements uh, during the period of time, we have been able to develop and uh, obtain uh, ethical approval for the surveillance protocol. Uh, we developed uh, surveillance SOPs and uh, training materials. Then we have included um, more than 99% of the births in the hospitals into the surveillance. This leaves us with um, an error rate of uh, only 0.4% the birth defects that have not been included. Uh, this project also has a nested case control study, which I've not talked about much, but we have included 691 out of 902 uh, cases and uh, 1,067 controls. Um, we have presented abstracts at uh, conferences and uh, we presented four oral abstracts and uh, three poster presentations. We have also presented or um, written uh, papers and manuscripts of which three have been published, two are under general review and three are under um, various uh, levels of development. So these are the three published papers which you can uh, um, get to and uh, read to get more details. 
uh, we have also faced uh, some challenges. And uh, here I present some of the key issues and the solutions we look at. One of the issues we have is that uh, this program is mainly uh, vertical. It's independent and not embedded within uh, the national health system. It only covers a limited area of the country, that is uh, Kampala. And um, we are unable to assess uh, the survival, some of the outcomes like survival, uh, say um, rehabilitation of the babies, and then also to evaluate um, uh, preventive measures within the country. So uh, the solutions we have for this and which we plan uh, to uh, implement include integration of this within the national health system, and then uh, improve on advocacy and uh, stakeholder collaboration and expansion uh, to other hospitals um, out of uh, Kampala. I acknowledge um, the staff of the Bath Defect Surveillance Project, then uh, the surveillance hospitals and uh, our collaborators, uh, CDC Uganda and uh, US CDC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and thank you, everyone. So before I open up the, the floor for questions, I just want to wait, make one announcement before people leave. Um, if you are happy for the Global Health Network to share your email with us to be invited for future events or to become a part of the network, please type yes into the chat. And now I'd like to open up the floor or any questions. If you do have a question, you may also type it in the chat room um, or raise your hand and we will let you in. We'll, we'll allow you to speak. So any questions? Let me see, do we have a question? So we, we do have a question about congenital heart disease and the use of pulse oximetry. Um, I do want to note that we, we are going to have a webinar that will actually focus on that in the near future. And one of the issues that we'll focus on is using pulse oximetry for screening um, for congenital heart disease. So I encourage you to, to join us for that future um, webinar. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, if not, I would like to summarize our session. So today we've heard from our speakers and, sorry. Yeah, and we basically defined what a congenital anomaly is. We've also looked at the change of congenital anomalies over time, especially in South Africa, and the need for genetic services. Um, I think not only in South Africa, but many of the other countries. We've also discussed briefly about prevention and morbidity, and we've heard from three programs. Um, the one from Cameroon that is new and emerging. We've also heard from our colleagues in South Africa who are implement, who, who've been active and now implementing a national protocol. And we've also heard from Uganda as well, uh, which is also in transition to um, developing a national program but currently running as an independent program. So I would like to say that going forward, we are going to be talking about more topics as well as hearing from other African surveillance projects. Um, on the screen, you will see a new website that's in development. We're hoping to launch it. And on this website, we hope to post uh, various articles as well as resources that may help you in your activities. And we do encourage um, feedback as this is something in development. I do want to acknowledge the co-investigators 
of this project uh, who are shown here and they're from South Africa, Nigeria, as well as the UK. But I'd also like to acknowledge the other program um, co-investigators co as well as partners that have been involved um, who are shown on the screen here. And we also want to acknowledge the partners who are here to support us in our journey as we try to increase the capacity for birth defect surveillance in Africa. So we want to thank you very much for your support and please remember to respond to the poll that we just sent out. Our next webinar will be on the 28th of July and we'll be talking about congenital anomalies and mortality, child mortality. So please look out for our notifications and feel free to share the webinar with many of your colleagues who you, you think are interested in either joining the network as we begin to establish, as well as interested in supporting children who are born with congenital anomalies. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for attending our webinar today.